Well, around the year 423 AD, there was a man named Simeon the Stylite. Now, he was a, a desert hermit, um, and he was a professing Christian, and he um, believed that the way of spirituality was to isolate himself from sin and even others. So he decided to build a small pillar at the edge of the Syrian desert, and he decided that he would live on this pillar in the wilderness. Simeon lived on this pillar for six years in isolation. Now, many would come to visit him and to consider following his method of isolation. But of course, there were a lot of fifth century desert soccer moms that had one simple question for Simeon. Is, is there child care? <laughs> right? It, his, his philosophy was not even practical. But when we look throughout history, there are many and even professing Christians who think that to live a spiritual life means that we isolate ourselves from people. It resembles something like building a Simeon pillar in the middle of the desert. And this might mean that we isolate ourselves from the sinfulness of the world around us. And it could even mean that we isolate ourselves from even other believers. And we must ask ourselves this question tonight. Is this what it means to live by the Spirit? Simeon's pillar, it's an extreme, and it is to help us to understand that isolation is not what it means to walk by the Spirit and to live spiritually. What we're going to see tonight is Paul's discourse on living by the Spirit or walking by the Spirit. Now, if we look at our text and we look back at chapter 5, verse 25, he said, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Again, there was that call that if we have been born again by the Spirit, then let us live by the Spirit. Let us walk in all of our deeds and actions. And so now in these 10 verses, we get a discourse on what it means to walk by the Spirit. Now, we, as a point of review, we have looked at several things over the last several Sunday nights. We talked about how we've all been made alive by the Spirit through the work of regeneration. And because we have been born again, therefore we walk by the Spirit. Then we've also seen that um, authentic salvation has very specific beginnings. Authentic salvation begins with the work of regeneration of the Holy Spirit. And as he gives us a new heart, one of the initial evidences that we see is that you and I would place our faith alone in Christ alone. Now, our new heart is also manifest in our love for God. We saw that in chapter 5. And our love for others. We can go all the way back to even Hagar. And, and that we are called, this seed that God has put within us, causes us to love God and love others. Now, as we'll look at tonight, too, this love that God has put within us, this seed, this new spirit, also drives us to serve one another and serve one another out of love. And, and we discussed that this takes us further than the law ever could. As we serve one another out of love, we go farther and deeper than simply through law keeping. And so now we come to our passage for tonight and we get some specifics on what it means to live a spiritual life. And what we're going to see is that if you have a pillar in the desert mentality for living in the spirit, you don't have the same understanding of living by the spirit as the apostle Paul was teaching the Galatians. The Holy Spirit's work in our lives, it, it is to be nurtured and lived out in the context of community, in the context of the church and with others the fruits of the Spirit are to be shared and spent on others. As Philip Ryken puts it, the Holy Spirit does not produce this fruit for our private enjoyment. 
true spirituality is not an individualistic quest for self-fulfillment. And so we see tonight that what we're going to see is that for us to live spiritually, it is, we have to do it in community. We can't live in a desert isolated from other people. Well, as we walk through this text, I believe that there can be five sections that we'll look at. It can be divided into five sections. But before we get to that, I, I wanted to make mention about the structure that we're going to see. It's very interesting because what we find is that what we'll see is that there are going to be two principles, two ways of living that Paul is going to give us. He's going to give us to bear one another's burdens and then to do good to all people. These are the two kind of principles, the things that we are to do. But what he does is he introduces each one with a specific application. Now, why does he do that? Why doesn't he start off with the principle and say, here are some ways that you can do it? Well, I believe it's for emphasis and priority. And so when we look tonight, this will make sense as we walk through it. And we see verse one that calls us to seek to restore our brothers who are in sin. He's actually giving us the first priority of bearing one another's burdens. This is the first thing that as Christians, we are to know and understand how to do before we bear people's financial burdens or anything like that. So let's begin to walk through this. So living spiritually means that we help restore our brothers from sin. Look at verse one again. It says, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. And he also gives a warning. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. The call in this verse, it's, it's very clear. It's very simple. Those who are walking in step with the spirit are to help those who are not. Those who are mature in their faith are to be helping those who are immature in their faith. This is a very much discipleship model that we see even in perhaps Titus 2, you know, believers walking with other believers and discipling them and, and teaching them the word of God and how to walk by the spirit. Now, this can be very hard. It can be very hard because Christians can fall into some serious sin, complex and difficult sin. I've always valued what the late R.C. Sproul um, would say in his explanation about the depravity of man. He would talk about how genuine believers, genuine born-again believers still can fall into deep and dark sin. But even though that these Christians fall into sin, they will not remain there. They will not remain there. One of the means God uses to restore his children from sin is through other believers in the church. It is the duty of the Christian who sees his brother in sin to seek to restore him to righteousness. It is our duty. Now in, in the verse here, it says, if anyone is caught. Now this, this Greek word here might, might lead us to uh, a different definition that it has. When we see the word caught, we might think of a trap, a snare. While sin are, it is those things, that's not the, the definition of this Greek word here. This word is to describe something being discovered. You might use this when your, your child has snuck into the cookie jar and he comes into the room or she comes into the room and you ask your child, have you been into the cookie jar? And they say, of course, no, mommy, no, daddy, but they have chocolate on their face, right? And we might say, you have been caught, red-handed, okay? They're not in a snare, they're not in a trap, but they have been discovered, it's been discovered, their transgression. And so this isn't really speaking about egregious sins, unrepentant sins. Paul deals with that in a much different way in 1 Corinthians. If we had time, we could go back to 1 Corinthians chapter five, look at verses um, like verse five all the way down through 11, and he, and he gives a lot of instruction, right, to the unrepentant, sinner who is in adultery or idolatry is that we are to disassociate with them. We're supposed to be disciplined on them. 
And so this is not this type of relationship. This is, this is a person who has, through the teaching of God's word, through living life as a Christian and growing, they've realized that there's some areas that they're not living up to God's command. Some of you tonight, in some of the things I say, may realize tonight that you aren't really living up to God's word and his instruction. That you might learn tonight that in fact you have transgressed his directives for you. Well, this is a lot different of a situation than the guy in 1 Corinthians 5. This person that we're talking about here simply needs a brother and, or sister to come alongside them and to disciple them, right? And to nurture them into the faith and, and to take these real sins that they're struggling with and, and take them to God's word and to show them what God's word has to say and to lead them into all truth and righteousness. That's what this person needs. That's what we're called to do in this verse. Now, you and I, we should really have a desire to do this, right? We should have a desire to help our brothers and sisters around us that are struggling in sin. We, sh we should have a desire to help them have victory over this sin and to walk in the spirit and in faithfulness to the Lord. This we've been talking about. This is the sincere brotherly love that is an evidence of the spirit at work within us. So if we see a brother in sin and we say, well, good for him. I didn't like him anyways. That's not an evidence of the spirit. And that would cause us to pause, right? And say, wait, what is going on in my heart? I should desire even the most, you know, uh, person that we don't get along with, you know, the person that we just don't like. The, these people, we should still desire to see them restored. This is what the spirit does within us. He bends our heart towards this kind of love. It is a Christ-like love. Is this not what Christ did for us? He sees us in our pitiful state. And he takes action and he goes to the cross. He, he puts on flesh and comes down and walks on this dirty earth and disciples men so that they might then propagate the gospel on after he goes back into glory. This is exactly what Christ did for us. Now, let me, let me connect now. There, there are gonna be some warnings, but let me just talk again. This whole thing of being able to restore a brother who is caught in sin should be our first priority when talking about bearing one another's burdens. Verse two, that is what he's doing here. Think about it in this way. If you had a man who was very charitable and he, he gave lots of money to the poor and he helped people, he brought people into his house and he provided people with means and you met this guy and then you found out that his mother, his own mother was destitute and in great need, who was going hungry, who was unclothed. What would we say? We would say, go take care of your mother first and then go take care of the world, right? It's like on the airplane. You know, those of you, the fields got to fly recently and so they, they give the same spiel every time, right? You know, here's your life vest and you pull here and you blow in there, you know, all these various things. But what happens when the oxygen mass falls down, when the cabin is depressurized? What do they always tell you, parents? You got to put the mask on yourself first and then help. So there is a priority there. And the same thing here, if we were to bear one another's burdens, the priority begins with us restoring and discipling those around us. And so let me ask you a question. How good are you at that? How much have you done that? I mean, sure, it's easy to pull out your wallet and throw some money in the plate. Or, you know, you meet somebody that needs their electric bill and fine, you write them a check, boom. That's easy. But how many of you have taken the time to get to know people, to know where their struggles are, and then walk them through the biblical text and pray with them and meet with them and give that kind of time to them? What Paul is saying is that should be your first priority. It should be the first way that you bear one another's burdens. Now, whenever you say something like this, though, you, you know, those of you who are spiritual ought to seek to restore those who are caught in some sort of sin, this is dangerous. 
I mean, this is what they call in the South, this, this might be meddling, okay? Getting in somebody's business. All right, this is dangerous to tell somebody that they should be seeking this out. And you know what? It's not just a concern for me and a scare today, but I think that Paul knew how dangerous this was too. And so what does he do in the next several verses? He gives us some, some warnings. He gives some instructions on, on how to do this. Because the temptation is to hear this command and to think that God is calling you to go around and police people's lives. Like, oh yeah, that's not right. Nope, 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 nope. You know, and you go around and then all of a sudden you've, you've turned into the spiritual righteous police officer. And so, you know, I remember when I was young, um, which many of you say that's now, but when I was younger, okay, when I was in high school, I remember there was a boycott on Disney movies. Some of you might remember this. I mean, it, in my area in Georgia, I mean, it was a real deal. Like, it was sinful to watch a Disney movie. And I'm like, really? I love Aladdin. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. And that, that, some of you might be like, well, I'm not listening to him anymore. <laughs> but... Th- they, they went around and they, they took this thing that was a conviction, right? Like, oh, we don't like Disney movies. And they, they made it into a law. And, and so this is where we can kind of fall prey to, right? That we can um, go around and we can be the spiritual police and every conviction that we have is law. And then we can tell everybody, oh, no, no, that's not how you do it. And no, no you don't watch Disney movies. You don't shop at Target. Um, you don't shop at Home Depot, none of these things, you know. And these are convictions that are turned into laws, Right? Well, I think that this ultimately leads to what Paul knows and we know that this is gonna lead to pride. Um, Sometimes as we think of restoring others, we, we need to battle against pride. And he says here, restore him in a spirit of gentleness. And so we get, we get two really big directives here on how we're to do it. And we're to restore him in a spirit of gentleness. And then we're also to keep watch on ourselves. And so to be done in a spirit of gentleness and love um, is very important as you disciple somebody else. You see them in a way in which they're not following God's law. And we, what does that mean, to be gentle and loving with them? Well, it means we're patient. We, you know, we always want everybody else to be patient with us. But a lot of times when we perhaps are in that situation, we don't give the same kind of patience to others that we would like for them to give to us. You know, we might have struggled with a sin for a season of our life and we really just wanted people to be patient with us and love us and to, to uh, pray for us and things like this. And then we overcome it and then we're, all of a sudden we're like, oh yeah, it's easy. Like, why are you not there? When it took us a, a time to do it as well. And so we are to do it in a spirit of gentleness and love, grace, and we're to do it because they, they need that just like you and I needed that. We are also to be careful, he says, not to be lured into the same type of sin. Well, he, he, I say the same type of sin. This is normally how we read it, right? That he says there, keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. Well, you know, when you're working with somebody and discipling them and they're in a certain sin or transgression, we do need to be careful that we are not sucked into that as well. This is a a great message for our teenagers, right? You might think, I'm going to be missional and I'm going to like hang out with these people and share Christ with them. But my illustration that I got a long time ago and I learned from somebody that I can't remember, otherwise I'd give them credit, is he would talk about how you take a pure white glove and you stick it in mud. Well, the mud never gets glovey. The glove always gets dirty. It always gets muddy. And so we need to be careful as we seek to evangelize and, and help our brothers that are in sin, not to be lured into them. But there's more, there's more sins, right, that we could be lured into. Like we, I just mentioned, pride. Thinking that, you know, God has given us as the gifted spiritual police on planet Earth and that we know what everybody should be doing and we don't look at our own lives, Right? This could be that pride, and and it's a killer in cases. Um, God opposes the proud. It's very clear. You know, sometimes we we walk around with giant beams sticking out of our eyes, right? With tweezers in our hands. 
saying, oh, excuse me, did you know you have a little speck in your eye? Could I, could I help you with that? All the while you have a big beam, you know, that like they're trying to dodge while you're trying to get the speck out of their eye. That might sound familiar to you. Well, this is the first thing. We are to bear one another's burdens by restoring them spiritually. So let's look at verses two through five really fast. This is the principle, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself, but let each one test his own works and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor for each will have to bear his own load. Well, we are to bear one another's burdens. These are, these are burdens or weights. This can be translated into weights. And this is different than Hebrews 12, 1, where we are to cast off every weight. There are two different words communicating the same thing. But I think Galatians helps us understand a little better the Hebrews 12. Because Hebrews 12, if we only had Hebrews 12, we might think, oh yeah, this is something that I do on my own. I just need to be casting off these burdens all by myself. But here we have a very complimentary verse that tells us that we are to bear one another's burdens. We are to help each other in casting off these weights. There are some weights that require assistance. Meaning, even in my own life, thinking of myself, there are things struggles, etc. that in order for me to overcome, guess what I need? I need you. I need you to help me, to help bear my burden. And the same is true for you. There are things and struggles, and growth and discipleship, etc. that you need someone else within the body to help you with. Otherwise, it will not happen. It is a weight that is meant to be carried by two people or more. You guys seen, you guys been to the Walmart or the Home Depot and it says, you got the little, the thing that's really heavy. And what does it say on it? It says like team lift. Okay. These are burdens that are team lifted. And so we, we need one another. Listen, when we get to verse three, it talks about if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. You know, if we think that we have it all together, if we think we're all that and a bag of chips, is that we deceive ourselves. It's, it's not like, you know, when someone thinks they're something and they're, they're kind of great. No, it says when somebody thinks they're great and they're not. I mean, one of the most fundamental things about the gospel is our depravity and frailty, that we need to be rescued and we need God. If we had time, we could look at verses in 2 Corinthians 4, 7 and 1 Corinthians 15, 9 or 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. And we hear the words of the Apostle Paul, who is arguably other than Jesus, probably of the church age, one who should receive probably the most praise. I mean, he wrote most of the New Testament. He did a lot of things that you and I did not do or would not do maybe. But when you read these verses, what you find is a humble man who talks about himself being the least of the apostles. And he talks about himself as being weak and frail, even talking about the gospel residing within a jar of clay. And you guys know that a jar of clay is easily broken. And this is what Paul is saying. He's, he's reminding himself and he's declaring his own depravity and frailty. This doesn't sound like a man puffed up. I think he reminds us that we're all in some way charity cases. We all need charity. We need someone to love us and to disciple us and help us grow. Just some people are deceived and they don't think that they're a charity case. They think they don't need help. They think their, their role is just to help everybody else. Well, let me tell you, that is not true. And you're being deceived. If I thought that about myself, I would be deceived. We need one another. Think about this. Why, why do you come to church? Um, why did you come today, this morning? I hear things like this. Well, I come to recharge my spiritual batteries, which I like that. That's cool. I come to church because I want to learn more about the Bible. That's the Sunday school answer, right? 
I come to church because it is the right thing to do. Now that is some of the honest answers, right? I come to church because I like this song played with that instrument. Or it could be, I like expository preaching. And we might say, amen, that's right. Or I'm reformed. But, you know, when you think about this, how many of us got up this morning and said, I need to go to church because I'm desperate. I desperately need someone else to team lift this burden in my life that I otherwise, if I sit at home, if I watch it on live stream or whatever else, I am not going to get someone bearing my burden with me. Think about that. We don't come to church just to get more facts. We come because we need each other. I mean, we are charity cases. And uh, in order for you to come to church with that mentality, you have to come to the grips that you are a charity case and that you need other people and that you don't have it together and that there are areas in which you are probably knowingly or unknowingly transgressing God's word. So we keep moving. Verses four and five, but let each one test his own work. This is a little bit of a confusing two verses for me. But let each one test his own work and then his reason to boast will be in himself. What? Is Paul confused? What happened here? We aren't to boast in ourselves. He says, reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor for each will have to bear his own load. He just got done telling us to bear one another's burdens. And he just says, you got to bear your own load. What is he talking about here? He's talking about the motivation by which we do these things. We don't bear one another's burden for the praise of men, for the praise of our neighbor. This is our own burden to bear. As we, as we minister to those around us, look, this is, this is an outworking of the, the spirit working within us a new heart and a new life that he has given to us. The work of regeneration, this is just the outpouring of it. And this burden, you and I, we bear alone. We have a responsibility to love and to care for one another. So he's not saying here that we should boast in ourselves or anything like that, but he's, what he's saying is that you, you can't hang your, your coat on someone else's hanger. And we don't seek for the glory of someone else, we seek for the glory from God. This is between us and God. Ultimately, the call is that you and I, we bear one another's burden primarily, first and foremost, one another's burdens with sin. And in so doing, we will fulfill the law of Christ as we bear one another's burdens in all things. Well, what is this law of Christ? We're talking Galatians is right, very like leave the law, go to faith. Well, he's, he's going back to earlier when he talked about Jesus, when Jesus taught that um, in verse 14, for the whole law in chap chapter five, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is our loving way to do this. this is, we fulfill the law of loving our neighbor when we bear one another's burdens. Well, let's move on to verse six. When we see this, he says, one who is taught the word must share all good things with the one who teaches. Well, this is our priority. And we're going to get in the next several verses down to verse 10, the principle to do good to one another, to good, do good to all people. And he begins, and now I'm just, I'm teaching what Paul said here. Okay. So don't shoot the messenger this is the word of God. And the word of God says, those who um, are taught, we must share all good things with those who teach us the word of God. Christians are to support their pastors. Now this has looked different throughout the ages. You can think about in the first century, they might've supported their pastors in some way, maybe financially with agricultural produce, etc. We can see this even in the Old Testament with the Levitical priests, the people supported them. They are to share all good things. You notice it doesn't say share their leftovers. It says share their, all their good things. 
all good things with the one who teaches. This is just one way in which God calls the church, his people, to honor those who shepherd them in God's word. Now, again, like I said, there's probably other applications during the first century, but today we, we primarily think about this, what, through financial support and then also what I really, what really, obviously it doesn't pay my bills, but what I really enjoy is, you know, just affirmation and encouragement, you know? We're, we're glad that you're here, <laughs> you know? Believe it or not, pastors go through seasons where they don't hear that where no one comes up to them and says, you know what, we are so thankful that you're here. I mean, pastors really go through seasons like that. I might have experienced some at times. But we support our, we're called to support our pastors. And think about it again in the context of this is the first priority. You think about this. If you are doing good to everybody else on planet Earth and you're treating your, the one who is, and you're a Christian, right? the one who is teaching you the word of God, you, you neglect him, there's something wrong. This is the person who feeds you the very word of God, the very, the very lifeblood of us as Christians, right? Far more important than bread on a table. And so we must take care of our pastors first. This is the call. This should be the first priority. Again, this makes sense because we're Christians. We have an eternal perspective. We know that this life is fleeting, but it is important, right? Because the decisions we make in this life have an eternal impact. I'm not saying that this life isn't important, but we have an eternal perspective. We store up our treasures in heaven, not on earth. Now, again, I think that Paul, he mentions this for a few reasons here in verse six. These are just my own speculations. So here you go. They may be worth nothing to you, but this is why I think he wrote these. Number one, for the preservation of the preaching of God's word. He wanted, I mean, God wants to preserve the preaching of his word. How do we do that? Well, by supporting those that study and teach it to us. Now, some of you in here, you've never prepared a sermon. Some of you maybe in here, uh, you've never even prepared like a Sunday school lesson. Some of you have, and some of you obviously have have preached (laughs) in the room. But some of you have no idea that the amount of time it takes to wrestle with a text and to study and to read other authors and to, to, to pray over it and to say, you know, do I have this text right? You don't just read it on Saturday night and then come in Saturday, I mean, Sunday morning and preach, oh, this is what I think you get, you know, and hope you get it right. It takes time. And those of you out there, you know it takes time to read. That's how you have to prepare for a sermon. You read You don't go to the movies. Some guys in our culture do. That's where they get their stuff from. They go to the movies or, you know, whatever, watch television programs. No, you read, and that takes time. So in order to preserve the preaching of God's word and to preserve good preaching of God's word, I think you need men who are devoted to the study and prayer of God's word. I think he also did it to remind all of us that we have to contribute. We all contribute. I mean, I know that there are people in here that, that are, are more obvious or more outwardly a charity case that need help, right? They need financial assistance. They need some various things and we help them. But we cannot forget that all of us in here, even that person is to contribute. They are to give. I mean, we think of what giving is. It's It's not how much you give. It's the heart and the attitude in which you give. So yeah, you may be, you know, you may be financially struggling, but you still can contribute. So there's nobody that's supposed to be in the church that's just constantly like this. You know, oh, you guys have met these people, right? (laughs) They're like, everything's for me. Yeah, I didn't like that music today. Maybe we can pick a different song next week and I'll enjoy myself. You know, or, you know, I need people to do this and that for me, etc. But then when other people need help, they're nowhere to be found. You know, it's like they, they vanish. They're like magicians. Well, this ought not be so. And so he reminds us to contribute. 
Well, enough about that because I'm talking to one of the most loving and generous congregations, not only have I, that I've been a part of, that I even know about, okay? So enough about that, let's move on. The third and fourth are really simple. We get to verse seven. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows that will he also reap for the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. This is very s- simple. You, you sow into the spirit, you sow spiritual things, you reap spiritual fruit. As we love and care for one another, we, we, we reap good spiritual fruit. And as we walk in the flesh, in selfishness or in isolation, etc., you know what you reap? You, you reap fruit of the flesh. Discontent, paranoia, fear, etc. Verse nine, let us not grow weary of doing good for in due season we will reap, amen. In this life, we, we, we plod through. We do good to people who aren't even good to us. We love our enemies, even when we don't want to. Why? Because we're not looking for the praise of men. We're not looking for a reward from men. We are looking forward to that time in which we see God face to face and he judges our works. And we also receive rewards for our faithfulness. Now that blows my mind. I still don't get that. You know, some things we talk about, the sovereignty of God, not understanding. I, I do not understand standing before God one day and him giving us rewards for our faithfulness, right? It's like when you give your kid $5 to go down the aisle and buy you something and coming back and then giving him another $5 to say, way to go. Well, you really stepped it up there and, and I'm just so proud of you. But we'll receive reward and we look forward to that. So let us not grow weary in doing good. Verse number 10. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. That's the principle. You and I were to do good to everyone. We're to do good to, the, to our enemies, to our neighbors, to our coworkers, to our bosses that overlook us for promotions or, you know, um, everyone. We're to do good. We're to seek to do good and to be a blessing to everyone around us. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it looks like to have the third person of the Trinity dwelling within you because that's his heart. But I want, to no- I want you to notice this last phrase, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Have you ever paused to think about that? I wonder if the social gospelers have thought this through, have read this text. You know, as we think about how we are to live spiritually, we are to go into the world. We are to preach the gospel. We are to make disciples in all the nations. But we are to especially, especially do good to those within the body of Christ. What does that word especially mean? Why does he use it? Well, it's an emphasis. He's telling us the priority as we do good to everyone is right here. So look, you don't, don't talk about how you're doing good to people out there and you come into this place and you backbite and you gossip. It doesn't make any sense. You and I, this is the priority. First, this is where we put the mask on first so that we might be effective out there. And so this is why I don't understand why people neglect the gathering of the body of believers. I mean, how, how are you to especially do good to those within the household of faith if you're not here, right? I mean, again, I'm preaching to the choir. I know I get the Sunday night crowd. So a lot of the stuff I say, it's like, obviously you're saying, yeah, John, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> I've been here, <laughs> okay, for like 64 weeks in a row. And I got sick only that one time that I missed, I know I'm talking to, to, to you all, but maybe there are people online and, and maybe you need to be reminded of this yourself that as you are focused out, maybe, maybe you haven't been as focused as you need to be on being a blessing and doing good to people within our body because you're to be especially doing good to those. Now, there might've been first century hipsters, you know, that are just like, 
Oh, no, it's what the spiritual thing is just to go out and feed the homeless and do things like that, which, again, that is good. But the priority, the especially, is here. Think of Paul, the great missionary. Think of how many people were converted under Paul's ministry. How many do we have record of? Not very many. Only those that pertain to the church. And so we see the emphasis. So as we close, it's not spiritual to live on a pillar in the middle of a desert. Look, and I, I know that a lot of us, we, we want to remove ourselves from a lot of this sinfulness in our culture. Yeah, but look, we cannot live on a pillar because we would violate the principles that we have here in Galatians 6. Living spiritually is done in the context of the community of the church. It's also not... Um, spiritual living for you just to primarily focus your attention on ministering outside the walls of the church. We are to especially focus on ministering inside the, wor- the, the walls of the church. And so, this is my encouragement to you, is to especially minister within the church. And then also, some of you maybe need to learn how to disciple somebody and to walk somebody through the text. That, that takes time of learning the scripture, memorizing it, helping people address their sin through God's word. Well, this is my encouragement to you to bear one another's burdens primarily through bearing one another's spiritual burdens, to do good to one another first by loving your pastors and supporting them. And then secondly, being focused within the body and then going out into the world. Let's pray. Father, as we think about this text tonight, um, in some ways, even in my own heart, I'm convicted. There's, there's always ways in which that we can love our brothers and sisters in Christ and bear one another's burdens and do good to one another. There's always ways we can do that more. And I know, Father, we're all busy, or at least we all think we're too busy to do these things. That's a lie probably from Satan. God, would you help us to make these things a priority? Um, It's hard to do good for somebody if you're not with them. It's hard to help bear one another's burdens spiritually if you don't know what they're struggling with. All of this stuff, Father, takes time. And so we, we pray that you would do that within us, that you would foster these things that you desire within us, and that we would be obedient tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.